So this week we're examining how the French left Vietnam and how the relationship that the United States had created with the French during the period of the French First Indochina War and then also um, the period afterwards that necessitated, at least in the eyes of the United States, that it stay put there in Southeast Asia. And of course, as we talked about last week, we know that this has a great deal to do with the Cold War. We also know that it has to do with economics as well. It also had a great deal to do with the fact that the United States wanted to nation build. Um, and the United States, uh, regardless of, of the Cold War, regardless of all the geopolitical international system issues that it was going through at the time, really wanted to nation build. And we saw this initially with Cuba at the turn of the century. So the United States really, this is something that, that it sees itself doing, sees itself projecting um, democratic values, democratic institutions through the world as well. Well, it doesn't always turn out like that, right? Obviously, uh, um, in the South, the South wasn't necessarily all that democratic once the United States had sort of planted its feet in the region, right? So the United States really had... had um, thought a great deal about wanting to project its own image in the world, but often, you know, thwarting those efforts by focusing on things like geopolitical strategy, focusing on things like the international system and how to stay, again, at the top of the heap, right, and also focusing on economics. So we want to start out with this week is talking about how the North is able to sort of assemble itself in the face and the wake of all of the, the subjugation that's going on around them and new concerns that maybe the United States would be their possible next subjugator, right? And we know that the North was was um, devastated, and pe the peasantry of the South were devastated after um, their loss in terms of their right to self-determination, things that they thought the United States were going to give them, which eventually led to the First Indochina War. But now that we're beyond the First Indochina War, where we have to recognize and figure out is how the North is, is able to create for itself not only a, a really strong base in terms of, of the North and, again, the peasantry of the South, um, but also how it's able to, you know, start start building for itself um, sort of a financial coffer, how it's able to build for itself a military. Um, and for for the North, and particularly for Ho Chi Minh, sort of the idea here at this point in time is to try and keep Vietnam afloat, right? It's about making sure that Vietnam is able to sort of keep itself together and be able to thwart an enemy, but to also make that enemy not so angry and to make sure that that enemy, that they might actually be able to stave off some sort of of conflict with a new enemy, that new enemy being the United States, right? So for for the North and for Ho Chi Minh in particular, the first idea is to make sure that they take like a very middle of the road approach. Um, again, Ho Chi Minh is starting to drift away from democratic principles and values and starts thinking a lot more about socialism and communism. But in terms of really re recreating Vietnam um, and creating a republic for Vietnam or some semblance thereof um, and fighting for that republic, um, he's really going to be focusing on the idea of, of let's let's think about representation among the peasantry. Let's think about what we can give in terms of, of uh, the peasantry to keep the peasantry on our side and to make sure that, that the people of Vietnam who are on our side already really know that we're there to, to fight for them. Um, they choose the idea of, of being very moderate in terms of their programs, in terms of their politics, and making sure that they don't ruffle any feathers, not only throughout Vietnam, but but also in terms of their of their enemies. Um, economically, they push really strong for, for development, um, for industrialized development. Um, they hope to even, in, in some ways, um, connect with the, the French um, and to, uh, to be able to sort of economically pull itself up by its bootstraps by tapping into the French system of, of economics that was already there in Vietnam. And it really doesn't work. There's a mass closing of French factories. The French are pulling out because obviously the United States is taking taking a, a more of an active role in the in the region. And so the French kind of see the handwriting on the wall that they're going to be sent packing pretty soon by the United States. Um, and so 
the North really can't push for development if they don't have that industrialized power trying to trying to help them and the French would have helped them in some ways um, simply because of the fact that the, the French wanted to make money off of them the French obviously wanted the natural resources of, of the region so that was a way that they could have coexisted right this is a way that that uh, the French and the uh, the Vietnamese could have coexisted but the Vietnamese obviously their idea here is that if they were able to somewhat industrialize they would have more money to finance um, their desire Desire to not only maintain the strongholds that they already had, but to also eventually branch that out across the south of Vietnam too, and create that that sort of utopia that Ho Chi Minh wanted that 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 Republic of Vietnam that that w that the United States and the French had thwarted time and time again for him. Okay, so in terms of you know the complications that are going on for the North, note the fact that not everyone is unified beyond behind the North. So we talked about last week the idea that there are a great number of people in the south of Vietnam that are not for Ho Chi Minh. They're not for anything that he wants. They're not for democracy. They're not for uh, socialism. They're not for communism because they're really interested in maintaining their ties to the West. Um, and, and in Ho Chi Minh creating that republic, necessarily the United States and the French are going to be left out in the cold. And so there are a great number of people in the, the south that are really interested in, uh, in making sure that there's a Western presence, regardless of whether it's the Fran Fran uh, France, rather, and really start thinking about the idea maybe it should be the United States, right? Um, because the United States is the leader of the free world. The United States is an economic powerhouse, is a military powerhouse, all of that, right? So there, there aren't, you know, not everyone in Vietnam is unified behind Ho Chi Minh. But we also know that not everyone in the North is unified with him. And we also know that in the South, not everybody's against him, right? But there are a lot of different ideas floating around um, in terms of what the North should be, what it should be politically, what it should be militarily. And all they foc although they focus on this idea of moderation, there are going to be a lot of, of uh, discussions about how far they should go um, and when they should really turn into violent revolt. And that's something that we're going to see um, as we move through the course and, and obviously see that once the North Vietnamese understand the fact that the United States are just as much of subjugators as the French to them, that they're, they're going to turn to violent, violent resistance. So eventually we see in this portion of the narrative um, in terms of the Vietnam War that the United States is obviously um, interested in in having a greater role in Southeast Asia um, and France really is on its last leg in terms of its its uh, imperial holdings right um, the French really are, are losing a great deal of their colonies but they obviously lost a lot when they lost the the first Indochina war and so the French really see, as I mentioned before, the handwriting on the wall. They know that they've lost a lot of standing in the international system, a lot of that due to World War II. It also has a great deal to do not just with the United States' performance in World War II, but also its ability to use that performance in order to gain um, more and more power in the international system. And as we mentioned last week, that we now have a bipolar system in terms of the international uh, system, and that would be the United States and the USSR. So the French really understand the fact that they're just kind of there in terms of, of Vietnam, that they've lost the war, but the United States wants them there to sort of maintain continuity, especially in the South, and that the French kind of see the fact that they're eventually going to be pushed out. Um, and, and it's true, right? They, I, put here the French believe that the United States is trying to supplant them. It's true. The United States does want to supplant them and the United States cozies up to they cozy up rather to the French simply because of the fact that they that they want to again maintain continuity and make sure that the North isn't able to infiltrate the South and to make sure that that they can sort of have a seamless transition um, to their own uh, power in the region.
And so this is something that, that in this point in time, this is about 1955, that we see that the United States, again, is cozying up to the French, and it's really trying to create sort of a, um, a, a bilateral power system and power structure in the south of Vietnam. Um, and that, again, is, is for a variety of reasons, but a very important reason is thwarting the north. So as mentioned before, the uh, the Viet Minh have really a, a weak presence in the South. Certainly we know that the peasantry of the South um, are at least on their side um, in terms of the Viet Minh. But we also know that a great deal of the peasantry doesn't want to um, actually declare the fact that they are on the side of the Viet Minh or join up with the Viet Minh because of the fact that they're they're concerned about being routed out by the French by the United States and also by French collaborators in Vietnam and so uh, um, the, the support is there for the Viet Minh but it is not necessarily that the Viet Minh aren't able to tap into it at this point but there are people who are actively working for the Viet Minh in the South. And the reason why this is important is clearly because of the fact that the United States, and this is the same problem that the French had, that the United States is really going to not understand the cultural and political makeup of Vietnam. And so they're not going to see, they're going to think of the South as being, oh, wholly on the side of the West. And that's not true. And the reason why they don't understand this is they really don't delve into, again, culture and politics and, and even socioeconomic issues, right? And so they don't really recognize this peasantry as possibly being a, a very strong force and a force to be reckoned with in the South, a peasantry that would join up with Ho Chi Minh. And so at this point in time, again, they're, they're afraid of, of sort of rearing their heads. They're afraid of being routed out. Um, they're afraid that something's going to happen to them. But eventually, they're not going to be afraid anymore, right? There are a great chunk of people from the south who are part of the peasantry who actually move to the north. There are others that remain in the south. And in remaining in the south, they keep party organization in place. They actually help in terms of, of the elections um, that... that uh, um, don't turn out the way that uh, even the West had really initially thought they wanted, but certainly don't turn out the way that the uh, um, the North Vietnamese wanted. Um, they're also thinking in terms of uh, militarizing themselves, um, so they have a very small organization of paramilitary, um, but they're they're definitely again concerned about what the West is going to see, what the West is going to understand about them and what they're doing. And so they have no real active or orders to be insurgents. They have no real active orders from even Ho Chi Minh to, to be violent in any way. The North is forcing them to remain nonviolent. The North is forcing them to go uh, along with what Le Duan discussed in terms of, and I think Carnau talks about this, the middle way. And the middle way is is just sort of holding your ground, being firm and holding your ground at this point in time, but thinking about the fact that things have to be done in moderation, right? Just like we talked about the Viet Minh in terms of the North, that everything needs to be in moderation. You can't just jump into creating a socialist or a communist utopia. You can't just jump into creating a republic because you know that the West is not on your side and the West is not is not interested in uh, um, making your own dreams come to fruition. The major player that you see in terms of the South throughout the documentary, throughout the book, um, and now we're certainly going to be talking about him in the summary lecture, is Nyo Din Ziem. And so this major player here is, is somebody who um, the United States has decided that it will sort of attach itself to um, because they think that he's malleable. They think that he's somebody that they can manipulate, right? And they come to find out that they cannot manipulate him. Um, and so for, for the people of South Vietnam who were French collaborators, um, he's somebody that they know well. 
Um, he was uh, um, actually a, a uh, elite member of South Vietnamese society. He um, was a Catholic, much like the French collaborators in, in South Vietnam, anti-communist because, again, they're connected to the West and they, they uh, want Western ideals um, infused into, into South Vietnam and maybe into the full republic of Vietnam. Um, he was the prime minister under Emperor Bao Dai, and so he is, he's somebody who the United States, as I mentioned, really wants to um, see if they can hold on to and sort of force him to do whatever it is that they want him to do. And Diem really teaches the United States that he's stubborn, he's inflexible. He's not malleable at all. He's not somebody who's just going to do whatever they tell him to do, even if it's for his own good. Okay, And so he's really somebody who's quite a character in this particular period of time in, in the, um, the discussion of this conflict, um, colonization, imperial, imperialism, and, and really this divide between the North and the South, because Diem really is interested in getting what he can for himself, maintaining um, that elite of collaborators in the South, um, and he is not interested in anything that Ho Chi Minh is interested in. And he also is somebody who's very, very, very out of touch with the countryside, too. So he is an absolute elitist. He's somebody who's extremely traditional, um, and even though he's okay with French capitalist development of the South, he himself is pretty lax to it, right? He himself is pretty like, oh, well, you know, whatever, whatever they do. Um, he's also somebody that's very interesting because um, people think of him as maybe being a very charismatic character and obviously the real charismatic character in Vietnam during this time is Ho Chi Minh. Um, Diem really is not going to be somebody who is, is uh, um, you know, you're, a, a regular person from South Vietnam, somebody who's not a collaborator, somebody who's not foreign, somebody who's from the peasantry, really is not going to hitch their, their uh, star to his wagon, right? Um, they're not going to really think about um, uh, really having a, a uh, um, good relationship or a good rapport with somebody like him because he stands for everything that they hate. Um, he stands for everything that they're concerned about in terms of their own lives, right? In terms of being able to uh, not be peasants, in terms of being able to have enough for their families and have enough, even enough food for their families, let alone have enough money for their families, right? So he really is a figure that, that is, is quite interesting in terms of he's, he's, um, pretty much despised by the Vietnamese people who are not elites and who are not collaborators. And he's also very interesting because of the fact that uh, the French kind of know that he's not somebody that, that they could really deal with. But the Americans totally believe that they can manipulate him. And it's really, really not true. One of the things he also does is he set up, sets up this divide and conquer sort of attitude in the South. Um, and he really turns a great deal of religious sects and the peasantry um, against each other or tries to turn them against each other. Um, and they get pretty angry about that, and they they uh, uh, band together and they try to take on the the government, and they try to do this in terms of, of violent resistance, which the North is not happy about. Um, eventually, what happens is that most of them are, are some of them are enveloped into uh, um, the government, um, and Diem really allows them to be a part of it because he knows that he can can talk about what the United States is trying to do, he can manipulate them, right? Um, but others, they sort of fade into the woodwork knowing that they had failed in terms of trying to overthrow him. Um, overthrowing Diem is going to be something that actually eventually happens, but it's not going to be by these people. So the 1950s, the mid-1950s, are really a state of flux in terms of what Western power is going to have control over South Vietnam. And the United States, again, um, is really trying to push out the French, and the French really know this. And so the United States initially starts out with little baby steps in terms of, of uh, trying to control South Vietnam. 
I mean, in many of the ways, and we see this with many Western powers, it's just not the United States, um, that you see that initially the efforts are kind of, you know, to win hearts and minds, right? And so the initial efforts are often uh, uh, charitable. Um, they often have to do with religion, right? Um, but they also have to do with a great deal of pop propaganda. Um, so the propaganda that was, was pushed in the South was anti-communist and pro-democracy. And again, sometimes that flies in the face of, of what initially, not forever, but initially what the North Vietnamese were trying to do and what Ho Chi Minh was trying to do. So then we see the United States sort of ramp up um, their efforts in terms of the military and in terms of economics. So the previous efforts were private and they were non-governmental organizations. And the new efforts in the mid-1950s and, and particularly in terms of the military 1956, they would be governmental, okay? And so the military efforts that the United States tried, um, they tried to start building an army for South Vietnam. Um, and this is something you want to keep your eye on for the rest of the course, right? Um, what the, the South Vietnamese Army, the SVA, um, uh, how what their origins are, um, how they are trained, uh, who they are trained by, and then are they able to, you know, ever reach a level where they are a really viable army. And that's something just to keep thinking about as, as we go through this, this uh, information, this material in the course. Um, the United States was giving a lot of, of training. Um, they were bringing in a lot of supplies and a lot of heavy-duty supplies, too, in terms of, of uh, military vehicles and things like that. Most of the financial assistance that the United States gave, or at least three quarters of it, actually went to these these military and sort of army building efforts. Um, the United States also tried some economic efforts, um, and they were really pushing in terms of imports and exports, trying to create um, a trade system there. And that trade system doesn't doesn't go uh, um, very well at first. They also try in terms of education. Um, in terms of for the uh, the countryside in the hopes of really gathering the peasantry of the south um, you know under their wing um, trying new agricultural methods uh, new crops um, giving a great deal of medical training that would again go out to the countryside and help the peasantry um, and then rebuilding infrastructure uh, particularly again in the um, countryside and so the United States is putting on a, a concerted effort here uh, to at the very least, tell the people of South Vietnam that they're on their side um, and that they're not necessarily like the French, um, that they're not always elitist, right? That they're actually trying to help the South and they're trying to help the South in total, right? That they're not just trying to uh, help the elites, that they want the peasantry to have better lives. And that's something, you know, in the image, obviously, of the United States. So these are things that they're, that they're really focusing on and things that they're really... Uh, um, putting a great deal of money into. In December of 1960, about five years after the United States started, started to put on a concerted effort uh, in terms of sort of winning the hearts and minds of the, of the people of South Vietnam, those that were not inclined like the elitists um, to uh, hitch themselves to the United States. Um, in, in a response to this, uh, the National Liberation Front was created. Um, and the National Liberation Front will, will be talking about a great deal during the actual conflict, actual warfare, uh, once troops are on the ground um, in Vietnam, American troops are on the ground in Vietnam, so we'll talk about them, the, they're the NLF. Um, their initial creation was really uh, more, more political. Um, and that they would eventually morph into a military organization. But their, their initial efforts were to organize the people of the South who were against the South Vietnamese elitists and, and the United States and the French. And so they wanted to create a strong base in the South. Um, they wanted to make sure there was national independence. They wanted a unified or united Vietnam. Sounds familiar, right? A lot of what Ho Chi Minh had wanted earlier. Um, they wanted a democratic Vietnam. Again, reinforcing that idea that initially Ho Chi Minh was not interested in a full communist state. He might have wanted a democratic Vietnam that had little elements of of communism and socialism sort of sort of floating around in it um but but he was really quite interested in a democratic and and uh, 
a Vietnam that was based on uh, American style principles. Okay. Um, so the NLF is, is going to fight for sort of a, a, a structure in the South that they can eventually envelop into the north of, of Vietnam and into their cause uh, from among those peasants. Um, and very few peasants are on the fence about whether or not they want the elitist collaborators or the United States or if they want uh, someone like Ho Chi Minh um, creating a, a nation for them. Um, so it's not that they have to round them up in terms of ideology. What they have to do is convince them that um, they can win and that they can win over the United States, maybe not even violently, um, and that, that the peasants would always be taken care of in terms of, of a republic of Vietnam that was created in the image that, that uh, Ho Chi Minh had wanted. Um, their long-term goals in terms of the National Liberation Front would be to throw off the yoke of, of uh, colonialism or imperialism um, and to end feudalism um, and certainly to end uh, the, the elitist nature of particularly the south of Vietnam, right? Um, this idea that there was a, a very elite group of people who sort of had control over everybody else in the south, right? And so what the National Liberation Front really works for, and they're able to obviously create this in the North very quickly, um, and what they're going to try to do in the South is to create uh, mass mobilization through mass organization. Okay, so they're going to put on a concerted effort, sort of full court press in terms of creating mass organization so they can mobilize the people of the South, envelop them into the North, and make sure that, that they have of the totality of Vietnam, especially in terms of the um, the peasants on their side, okay? But again, as we talked about in terms of, of uh, the North Vietnamese, they're really interested in being middle of the road, right, at this particular moment. They don't want to poke the United States and poke the bear, right? They don't want to um, make the United States angry, um, at this point in time. And again, they, they're looking to have nonviolent revolution. They're looking to have a nonviolent creation of a, uh, a republic. Um, and of course, it doesn't work out like that. But the reason why I'm stressing this is that we always tend to look at what we know about the war and what we're taught about the war in high school. Um, we're always thought to think of it always being for the North, some, it's about the military, about violence, about violent resistance. And as we've already learned to this point, it really was not always that. And it certainly not only moved toward that, but to an nth degree near the end. But it wasn't what was was in the forefront of Ho Chi Minh's mind, in the forefront of those leaders within the National Liberation Front. It really wasn't something that they were pushing at this particular point in time. Okay, so make sure that you're that you're recognizing that because I think that's a significant point of this course is that we really see that that the North Vietnamese and the peasantry of the South is a lot more violent. It wants revolution through through violent means, um, and and it it's focused on that a lot quicker than the North is. Okay, so National Liberation Front again starts out um, not very militaristic, ends up highly militaristic. Well, we dabbled in presidential history in, in the week one summary lecture when we were discussing Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Harry S. Truman and their um, flip-flopping on self-determination um, and the right for the creation of a, of a Republic of Vietnam. Um, and so um, they, they, you know, they sort of float in and out of our story, right? Um, and in the documentary, the Eisenhower administration for this particular week um, is something that's heavily talked about, right? And Eisenhower's all of this stuff in terms of the United States uh, ramping up its military assistance, ramping up, you know, the Hearts and Minds campaign and all of that, that's all done under the auspices of the Eisenhower administration. Um, your documentary also talks about John F. Kennedy, right? Um, and certainly uh, makes that correlation between his assassination and Ziem's assassination, right? Um, but I think Kennedy is somebody that we need to talk about in a little bit more depth. Um, and the reason being is that he's thought of in mainstream history as the president who would have never, ever escalated Vietnam, right? 
that his death allowed for Lyndon Johnson to come into power, and Lyndon Johnson was hell-bent to escalate Vietnam, and John Kennedy never would have put troops on the ground, right? And there is some evidence pointing to the fact that he, he would not have escalated the situation and didn't want to troops on the ground. And there is some evidence suggesting that, that he um, might have changed his mind, that he was obviously a very forward-thinking president, uh, but he was somebody who knew that if the situation got worse or if the North infiltrated the South, that there would need to be, at the very least, bombings and uh, more than likely troops would have to be put on the ground in order to save South Vietnam and possibly the totality of Vietnam, right? And so uh, Kennedy is somebody who you can't really, you know, pin him down in terms of, of the escalation in Vietnam, the escalation of, of uh, military conflict in Vietnam. And obviously, we're never going to be able to pin him down, right? You know, he dies in November of 1963, um, and we're really never, ever going to know what his true thoughts were. Or let's put it this way, if his true thoughts in 1963 were the fact that he never was going to escalate the situation, how was that going to change? if he would have won a second term, right? The situation in, in, uh, in Vietnam and North Vietnam particularly changed in, instantaneously, right? If, second by second, things were changing. Um, and so there's a very good possibility because Kennedy was a very flexible uh, leader that eventually he might have, ch have chosen this, okay? So in terms of history, we want to recognize the fact that it could have gone either way, but if we want to really want to be factual and really have strong interpretations about it, we're never going to know, okay? But the reason why I want to highlight him is discuss to discuss the fact that there really was a great deal of discussion about military escalation during, during this period. Um, for Kennedy, one of the things that, that he came into office thinking about was that the United States was really not being very proactive in the Cold War. It was being very reactionary. And so, necessarily so, he was going to project that on Southeast Asia. Um, and one of the ways that he projected that on, on Southeast Asia was eventually ramping up military assistance. Okay, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, but recognize the fact that he really is somebody who, or a president, who... Uh, um, came into office with very specific set ideas about foreign policy. Another thing that he changed that, that was sort of on the whole, not just about Southeast Asia, was that he was he really was concerned about a shift toward nuclear warfare. He wasn't necessarily concerned about that shift in terms of, of you know, we, we didn't want a nuclear holocaust. He was thinking a lot more along the lines of if the United States has to has to um, get embroiled in a conventional war, we need to make sure that we have all of our bases covered. So we can't move completely away from conventional warfare training, or we can't move fully away from funding conventional warfare, right? We have to make sure that we can do both, okay? And for Vietnam, the obvious concern is going to be, would we put troops on the ground? Uh, we obviously would be using technology, which is something, again, that, that, that Kennedy wanted that split, right? He wanted to focus on technology. He also wanted to focus on conventional issues in terms of warfare. In Vietnam, the, co the consistent concern was going to be guerrilla warfare, okay? And in terms of guerrilla warfare, what, what the United States was concerned about was could it, because it was so focused on conventional warfare, even though Kennedy wanted the, those, those numbers, even though he wanted people who were highly trained in conventional warfare, was that really going to work in terms of, of guerrilla warfare? So he decided that a major tactic that the American military should work on would be guerrilla warfare. Um, and the United States, I mean, learns about it, but I don't think that they really necessarily, and we see this in, in the Johnson era, we don't necessarily see the United States being able to use um, tactics that would thwart guerrilla warfare and that the, the North Vietnamese were really, really good and the Viet Cong was really, really good at using guerrilla warfare and that the United States was, was going to fail um, in terms of, of really not putting enough effort into thinking about this type of warfare but also recognizing, as I really want you to do throughout the course, it's recognizing the history of Vietnam, right? And we talked about guerrilla warfare back when we were talking about the uh, the revolutionary movements, right? Um, there was guerrilla warfare being used when the, the uh, Vietnamese were trying to throw off the yoke of 
of Chinese colonization. So it's something that they're kind of steeped in in terms of in terms of warfare, and they're very stealthy that way. Um, and it's a way that they're able to really, you know gain the upper hand in many in many conflicts uh, with the United States, initially with the French, and then with the United States. But recognize the fact that, that Kennedy was really forward thinking, really trying to cover all of his bases um, and trying to be able to um, project his ideas on uh, warfare onto the conflict in Vietnam. So Kennedy, in being the, the forward-thinking man that he was, um, he really put a lot of effort into thinking about what should be done in Vietnam, and he eventually decided to take a middle road. He was very cautious, but he was also very cunning in terms of what he did in Vietnam. The cautiousness was related to not getting the United States really heavily embroiled in the region, and especially in terms of ground troops. But he was cunning in terms of some of the other approaches that he took, uh, one being forcing political reform on the on the South, um, and then also uh, using covert action. He uses covert action in Laos. He uses covert action in North Vietnam. This is something he's going to be doing in Latin America, too. And so this, this covert action is going to really make the North Vietnamese angry and is going to start ramping up the idea among the National Liberation Front that maybe it might be time to start using violent tactics, right? We had talked about the fact that the NLF was not really focused on that yet. Um, and they were focused on initially the idea of, you know, being on the ready, but not necessarily trying to provoke anything with the United States. And so the covert action that Kennedy used started started ramping up those ideas for, for the North Vietnamese about maybe starting uh, violent resistance. Um, Kennedy also, um, as I was talking about in terms of, of escalation of the war and, you know, that, that myth that we can somehow figure out which way he would have gone, say, if he would have lived into 1964 and 1965 when Johnson escalated the war. Um, he, he really, it really was a consistent debate about how to escalate. Um, and again, one of the reasons why he was really cautious about escalation was he really didn't want to lose American lives. And, and being a, a veteran of, of World War II, um, he was somebody that, that really focused on the idea of, you know, we should only uh, put American troops on the ground um, if this is something that is highly worthwhile for the United States. Um, and it somewhat illustrates that, that Kennedy didn't necessarily see Vietnam as as the significant threat that other presidents had seen, okay? Um, and the idea that, that maybe he had um, not really focused on um, the possibility that the North was going to move toward violent resistance, right? Um, and so he was somebody who was really cautious about, you know, was it worth the United States' time? And so on one hand, he's thinking about, what well, is it worth our time? Well, of course it is because we don't want it to be a Soviet or a Chinese satellite. But is it really worth the United States' time because, and this is a, a racial issue as well, um, you know, is, is Southeast Asia really worth anything to, to the United States? You know, they're moving away from, from uh, even though they're still using it, they're moving away from the rubber of Vietnam as being, it's Vietnam being the actual supplier of that to the United States and moving to other places in terms of where they were getting that national resource. Um, so he really talked a great deal about among his advisors, um, and he was, a, he was a president who talked a lot to people, got a lot of different opinions, and then sort of weighed those opinions and talked about it even some more, you know, and often talked to his brother Robert about things. Um, and his thought was that we need to be cautious. We need to worry about raising the ire of, of the Chinese, raising the ire of the, of the, uh, the Soviets, um, that we should, should uh, even though he was wanted to be proactive, he also thought a lot about waiting and seeing what the larger power was going to do. So what was the superpower of the USSR going to do in terms of Southeast Asia? What was the massive military might of China? What was going to be going on with that in terms of Southeast Asia? Was Southeast Asia or Vietnam in particular ever really going to become a major satellite of either one of these two powers? Um, so he feared overextension 
attention as well because he was really concerned about the international system and could the United States so far away from home be able to sustain a very significant war not just with the north of Vietnam but also with these other major 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 military powers right um, so I just want you to recognize the fact that that with JFK it really isn't a cut and dry case right um, this is something that he had had discussed he discussed escalation um, he had often pulled back from the idea of escalation but it was always always on the table so who knows right who knows what would have happened if he wouldn't have been felled by an assassin's bullet much like Diem was okay so let's move along and let's let's talk a little bit more about how the uh, the administration actually interacted with Vietnam Kennedy eventually sent a team of military advisors over to Vietnam to assess the situation in South Vietnam. Um, and they recognized the fact that South Vietnam, Vietnam rather, was quite disorganized. Um, they also recognized the fact that South Vietnam, uh, many of the people, again, the peasantry, were not um, very happy with the government of South Vietnam, and they were not very happy with Diem, right? And so it was really important um, after they got there to start assessing what it was. You know, they were going over there to see if there should be escalation. And then they started recognizing that this disorganization was something they needed to tackle too. So they made a, a broad range of recommendations to um, John Kennedy. And the major recommendation that they had made was that they wanted a limited partnership um, and that uh, the United States and uh, South Vietnam would have been pretty much equals with unfortunately the United States giving more in in terms of the relationship but having sort of sort of equal influence right um, they recommend more aid more advisors more money more equipment coming in um, but they also advise against doing everything for the South Vietnamese and they really wanted the South Vietnamese to be able to win the war on its own because of the fact that, that they're you know if, if if they didn't do so um, then they would just be seen, number one, as a pawn of the United States, um, and they would also be seen as, as weak without the United States. So it would create a situation where the United States couldn't pull out of the region um, unless they wanted to uh, um, risk the possibility of, of infiltration of the South again, maybe not even just by the North Vietnamese, right? So... Um, there, this this group of military advisors that go over there, um, they recognize the fact that they really need to, again, they need to have a limited partnership. Um, they realize that they really need to keep intervention at a minimum. Um, and that, it, again, it would hurt the South Vietnamese if they didn't. Um, but they also started to kind of see the handwriting on the wall um, that, that it, it was never going to be a draw, right? It was never going to be something where there would be... Um, some fighting in the negotiation and look you know we've we've hammered all of this out obviously they knew this before in terms of the first indochina war but once those military advisors are there on the ground they're recognizing all of the chaos they're recognizing the split in the the south between the elites and the peasantry and they're really recognizing the fact that the united states shouldn't dig itself in too far okay but there's also a significant debate within the Kennedy administration about, okay, well, maybe we should go in and, and sort of escalate things, uh, try to get in there, try to kind of kind of nip things in the bud and move out. Or maybe we should just kind of start to pull away and, and somewhat leave it alone. And so there's an extreme fissure between the State Department and numerous members of the administration, the Kennedy administration, in terms of, of what it was that they felt was going to work in Vietnam. And this fissure, we all, always talk about it in terms of the Johnson administration, but its roots were in the Kennedy administration. And so this fissure really is going to, to define how Kennedy makes his decisions about escalation too. And so what Kennedy decides to do is he really does decide to go middle of the road. And he's like, let's increase aid. Let's not get too involved. Let's keep intervention at a minimum in terms of actual fighting. Um, but we really need to understand the fact that we need to give more aid. So he's, he's going to send more advisors, he's going to send more money, and he's going to send more equipment. And he actually sets up a group that, that uh, will carry out all of these plans for him.
Again, the whole point of going into this kind of depth in terms of, of Kennedy is recognizing the fact that a lot of the myths that are out there about about Kennedy um, and his de lack of desire of escalation um, really can be can be knocked down with some pretty significant evidence, right? And again, we can never know the full story. We can never know whether or not he really was going to escalate things in terms of putting troops on the ground, which is what we typically talk about in terms of escalation, and that's certainly what LBJ eventually does in 1965. But we clearly see that President Kennedy, before his death, uh, really ramps up a military assistance in South Vietnam, and they call it Operation Beef Up. Okay, so if that doesn't talk about escalation, I don't know what does. So he creates the Military Assistance Command for Vietnam, um, and this is going to be a group of close to 10,000 advisors who are going to be helping the South Vietnamese uh, government, particularly the South Vietnamese Army. Um, the United States is going to send a great deal more equipment to the region, but it's not going to be the supplies that it was before, ammo and guns and, and uh, military vehicles and things like that. They're going to start sending aircraft and they're going to start sending personnel carriers. And uh, obviously these are, these are extremely expensive pieces of equipment, but you can clearly see as the aircraft is coming in that they're really thinking about the escalation of the war via bombing, right? So the aircraft comes in, the personnel carriers come in. Again, personnel carriers thinking a little bit about the idea of, of possibility of troops on the ground, right? Um, they bring in a great deal of military assistance. Um, they train helicopter pilots. Um, they train South Vietnamese uh, um, military officials and uh, members of the military to be able to do bombing runs on their own. So teach them to fly, um, train them in terms of, of being able to drop bombs. And so you can kind of see escalation, but also keeping in mind what those military advisors had talked about before, which is making sure that the... Um, the South Vietnamese Army and the South Vietnamese government has more control than the United States, right? To make sure that they realize afterwards that they won if that was going to be the outcome, right? And so we really have to recognize the fact that we, there is a balance going on here. It's just something that we need to think about in terms of how equipment, how military um, advice, and then also how how training is really ramped up in this portion of time, okay? And again, it could absolutely be in terms of wanting to hand it over to South Vietnam. It also may be something else that's going on, and obviously Lyndon Johnson is the one who is able to benefit from all of these things that Kennedy has done in order to escalate the war. But that is, of course, for next week. So we're just about done here, um, and let's look at the, at the next slide um, and kind of start wrapping things up, too. The documentary and the book really highlight um, the coup in South Vietnam in uh, November of 1963, a really ominous time eventually in American history too, November of 1963. Um, so I want you to note the fact that um, the, the coup happened because members of the military were concerned over um, a rise in numbers in terms of the Viet Cong. Um, and they were also concerned um, just about to, just general chaos that was going on in terms of DM's, um, his, his administration, um, his relationship with the United States. And, you know, these, these members of the military were also uh, pretty confident about the fact that they would continue to see training from the United States and that maybe hopefully they would be able to take over the, the government of South Vietnam across the board, right, and to make sure that they eventually would push the United States out too. Um, but this military junta that, that had um, overthrown Diem and killed Diem, um, it was just as disorganized. Um, a lot of people blame that on the fact that, that the governmental structure was already disorganized and was very difficult to reorganize it, but the military junta was, was 
quite disorganized as well. Um, they had no real public support, um, and they had support within the military, um, but there was uh, factionalism going on in the military as to, you know, okay, should should we have done this? Should we do it? You know, who, who are we supposed to support? Who are we not supposed to support? Uh, what exactly are our objectives? What aren't our objectives? Like there were, there was massive factionalism going on in the, uh, um, the South Vietnamese uh, military. And so uh, the, the junta, the, the people of the countryside weren't, weren't at all happy about what had happened because they felt like they were trading one imperialist or one sympathizer for another, right? Um, the, the military is thought of as French collaborators. Um, it's thought of as, as collaborators with the United States then at this point because their augmentation is coming through the uh, assistance of the United States, whether financial or through actual uh, um, military advising. So it doesn't last very long. Um, this this junta um, and it what really occurs in this point in time is it shows that to the north that the south is in in chaos um, and that there's a great deal of disunity there's religious disunity there's there's the class disunity um, and there's also another pretty big issue that the uh, North Vietnamese had figured out that the um, the new military style government didn't really have a good plan politically it didn't have a good plan for st in terms of military strategy um and that it really was was uh not re it really didn't have a leg to stand on so the north was basically waiting with bated breath for it to fall and obviously it does The overthrow of Xiam and the eventual overthrow of the junta um, is something that really enthralls the, the north, right? Um, they're really happy about the chaos that the south has been thrown into. They recognize that the south has very little leadership at the time. And even though the United States is providing a great deal of assistance, they also begin to think about the fact that maybe they could actually thwart the efforts of the United States because they recognize that the United States really needs the cooperation of the south and it needs a, a highly organized and non-chaotic south um, to make sure that its objectives are met. And the North really recognizes that that, that may not happen for the United States. And so it really uh, starts ramping up um, its own efforts, thinking that maybe this is our shot once again to try and, and have an independent republic. So the initial military reaction here for the North is going to be rapid escalation. Um, they send supplies to the south, they send personnel to the south, so this escalation is not just in the north but also in the southern portions of Vietnam. Um, the, con the hope here is that they can take a situation that's pretty bad and make it worse, right, and send South Vietnam into a, into a tailspin, force the United States to give up, throw its hands up, and leave, okay? And they know that the, that the uh, southern uh, army is really frustrating the uh, United States and so they're they're just ready there to take advantage of all of these things and they really do so by the summer of 1964 just six months after after the uh, assassinations of both Diem and JFK uh, we see significant mobilization of Vietnamese forces um, and this is where we start seeing the United States ramp up the discussion of escalation once again. So very quickly after JFK's death. Um, and all of those things, all of the abilities to, to carry out this escalation are already there, right? Kennedy has already put them in place, including aircraft, okay? So uh, um, in the summer of 1964 is when we start seeing escalation. This is what we're going to discuss next week um, in terms of uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson um, and really recognizing the the escalation that occurs, why it occurs, and what the major effects would be of, of this escalation. And it's, it's not good for the United States. It really, really isn't. Um, so in terms of, of where we are for this section of the course, and, and I'll warn you here to get a pen because my uh, slide um, on the takeaways didn't, didn't upload here. Um, 
I want you to keep focusing on the development of the politics and the military of the North. So remember we started out here and we discussed the fact that in the North they wanted to take that, that middle ground, right? They wanted to uh, make sure that they had they don't escalate things with the United States, that they had a firm grasp and grip on themselves, um, and that they really just wanted to make sure that, that even politically everything was very moderate, right? And we see in this period the evolution of those ideas all the way to, to just full-blown um, violent resistance, right, and violent warfare by the time we get to 1964. So a pretty significant change there, right? Um, then we want to think about the idea um, of of how the South is is uh, making itself, you know, how the South is uh, creating itself, in sometimes the image of the United States, right? Um, we also want to think also backtrack for a second. We want to think about the fact that the United States eventually did take over for the French, um, and that is what's going to precipitate that recreation of the South, right? We're also going to think uh, a great deal about and, and sort of carry this on with us, this idea of Kennedy's policies and how Kennedy's policies actually allowed for Johnson to, to escalate things, to um, send even more equipment, and to eventually get ready to send troops, right? So those are the major, major elements here, right? They're the major, major things that I want you to, to be able to grasp in terms of the documentary and also in terms of, of the book. So hopefully this is another good nutshell sort of wrap up for you. And again, I know it's it's longer um, than I think you probably expected, but it really is is important, especially in this one, to really delve into to Kennedy. But it really is important to talk out some of these issues um, in a way that you don't necessarily get to do with the book or with with the uh, the documentary, um, and really talk out some of these, like the idea of of Kennedy in the mainstream um, and in mainstream history being being thought of as though he would never escalate, right? But if you dig a little further, you can see that there there was the possibility that he would have escalated the war, right? So that is it for this portion of of the course, um, and like I said, we'll be moving on to to significant escalation escalation rather of the uh, the conflict, um, and significant escalation also on the northern side um, in terms of con combating the efforts of the United States, and so that's what we're going to move into for next week.